his love for God and commitment to the biblical account of creation. Uh, Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Body of evidence includes nine major areas of the human body, including the skeletal system, the heart, and the digestive system. To see the next part, we're really going to have to temporarily remove the large, we call that the transverse colon. Now you're looking inside and you see how these valves are acting? Order today and witness the amazing design of the human body and be astounded at a great marvel of God's creation. Well, hello, I'm David Menton, and I'm a biologist here at the Creation Museum, and we're going to share uh, a favorite topic uh, with you today. Actually, anything I'm talking about relating to the human body is my favorite topic for that day. Uh, but, oh my goodness, the hearing ear and the seeing eye. If I were really pressed for two of the most amazing structures in the human body, I think the ear and the eye would be up there pretty high with the brain and and with the placenta, oh my goodness, that's wonderful too. We won't be getting into that today. We're going to talk about that hearing ear and seeing eye. And uh, I like to steal my titles right out of the Bible. I guess it's okay to steal from the Bible if you're going to share it, right, with people. And uh, here's where I found it. The hearing ear and the seeing eye. This is in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 12. The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. Boy, the Lord makes that pretty clear. It doesn't say anything about making the kidneys or the liver or spleen or anything like that. But he wants you to know for sure that he made the eye and the ear. And of course, he made the other organs too. Without him, nothing was made that was made. We read in John chapter 1. I'll tell you, I've worked with a lot of uh, physicians, uh, biomedical scientists over the years. And uh, not very many of them would have accepted this statement that the Lord has made both the eye and the ear. Uh, they would believe that it had come into being by some purely natural process that didn't depend on divine intervention. And uh, why do they do that? Do they just fail to see the complexity, uh, the integrated complexity of the eye and the ear? No, I don't think that's it. I think they understand that full well. I think they have another reason. Let's look into that. Psalm 94, verse 9. This is a sobering thing to think about. He that formed the ear shall he not hear, and he that formed the eye shall he not see? I have a question for you. <laughs> How well do you figure the creator of the ear would hear? I would assume he would hear well enough that uh, he could hear our thoughts. In fact, we know he can hear our thoughts. We see that in Christ. And then how well would the creator of the eye see? We'd look right into our hearts. We couldn't hide anything from him. And what would the Lord hear? And what would the Lord see as he looks into our hearts? Not something that uh, we really want to think about, huh? Pretty frightening. But it's even worse than that. You see, the Lord isn't just demanding that we behave sort of okay or that we keep most of his laws. In 1 Peter 1.16, we read, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord thy God, am holy. Oh my, that's a standard to, sit, to try to meet. So God can hear our thoughts, look into our hearts, and then he demands perfection. No wonder people run away from a creator. That's frightening. None of us could measure up. Well, thank the Lord, literally, for the redemptive work of his son, Jesus, who came to this earth, took the hit, we should have taken, paid the price we should have paid and wouldn't have been able to pay, took the sins of us all upon himself, and he became that Lamb of God, sacrificed for the sins of the world. So our perfection is not in us. Our perfection that we have as believers in our Lord and Savior is in Christ. He gets the perfection he demands in Christ. And when you know that, then a hearing, seeing God is a wonderful thing. Look at here, verse 34, verse 15 of the Psalms. The eyes of the Lord, all in capital letters, the great Jehovah God. 
The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, those made righteous in Christ, and his ears are open unto their cry. Wow, now we can afford to look at the ear and the eye. Otherwise, it'd be too scary. But knowing that our sins are covered, let's look. The hearing ear. You ever wonder what it is you hear? I mean, right now you're hearing my voice, I assume. Is something flying out of your TV or computer or whatever you're watching and listening to this on? Is something flying through the air, crawling into your ear and doing something? Well, let's take a look at that. Here's a person who's hearing sound. The sound, let's say, is coming from a little bell at the top of the screen there. And uh, these little dots represent air molecules. Uh, when sound is produced, it can only be heard in air. Uh, no sound can be transmitted in vacuum. And the air uh, kind of is in pulses. One molecule bangs into the next. And so it's not so much any object that flies from the bell to the ear that we hear. Rather, it's energy. Energy of these molecules being compressed and decompressed and compressed and decompressed. And so we're hearing air molecules pushing on our eardrum. And we might wonder just how much pressure uh, are we uh, hearing? What is impinging on our eardrum? Well, the ear is sensitive to a change in pressure of 1 times 10 to the minus 10 atmospheres. Yeah, I can see you're not too impressed by that. What are, we, what are we saying when we say 1 times 10 to the minus 10 atmospheres? Well, if we were at sea level right now, on a typical day, the air pressure would be one atmosphere. We're a little higher than that here in the tri-state area, so we're normally a little bit below one atmosphere. But anyway, suffice it to say, air pressure at sea level is typically about one atmosphere. We know that if we go higher altitudes, uh, years ago I drove the family up on uh, Mount Evans in Colorado, 14,260 feet high. And at that altitude, it's about a half atmosphere and the air pressure was much lower. It was hard to breathe. Here's a question. How high a mountain would we have to climb to experience the difference in air pressure in these little air pressure pulses that hit our ear up to 20,000 times a second that you can hear when you're young? Well, it'd be comparable to changing altitude approximately one thirty thousandths of an inch. This is not a big mountain. In fact, you probably didn't even know there was a mountain of 30 thousandths of an inch tall. Oh, yeah. It's called Mount Menton. Funny you've never heard of it. By the way, Mount Menton is not measured this way. Mount Menton is measured this way. Thickness. See if you had a micrometer like this. It would be about 30 thousandths of an inch thick, this piece of cardboard. So we could do a little experiment here. I'm going to climb Mount Menton. <laughs> not as young as I used to be. This could get risky. We'll go over here and set Mount Menton, which is 30 thousandths of an inch altitude, on the floor. And now I will climb up on top of Mount Menton. Okay, here we are. I am now 30 thousandths of an inch higher than I was before, and the air is a little thinner up here. Okay, so that part's not true. But just think about it. That difference in altitude between standing on the carpet and a 30 thousandths inch higher... <laughs> Our eardrum can perceive that when we're young up to 20,000 times a second, those little pulses of pressure. Wow, let's look at that eardrum. Let's look at the ear itself. There's a cutaway right through the ear starting from outside of the head going in. The bone in this region of the body is very dense in here. In fact, it's so dense they call it petrous bone as in pet petrified wood. It's uh, much more mineral in it and less organic material than elsewhere in the body. This presumably gives some hardness to this bone that's important for sound. And uh, uh, starting from outside here, we have an opening coming in the side, uh, the ear canal. And uh, sound then is transported through air as little pulses of higher pressure and low pressure will come into the ear canal and hit the eardrum. And we call this whole outer part of the ear, are you ready for this? The outer ear. Uh, then uh, the sound is transmitted from the air in the outer ear. It is transmitted to bone in the middle ear. And yes, the middle part of the ear is called the middle ear. I thought it was a clever name to give it. 
And there the sound, instead of going through air, is transmitted through bone. Three little bones, we'll take a look at them. And then after the sound goes through the bones, it goes to this part of the ear, uh, the inner part of the ear, which has been called the inner ear. I'm not going too fast, am I? <laughs> no, I didn't think so. So that's the inner ear, and that's filled with a fluid. Uh, this fluid that's in here is called endolymph. It's mostly water, uh, but uh, there are other things in it that are important. It's actually more like cell fluid, the fluid that's inside of a cell than like tissue fluid. Uh, it has a high potassium level, relatively lower chloride ion level. So you got the picture. Sound has to go from air through bone and then through water and inside that blue uh, colored structure, that just colored that way for your ability to see it, uh, this vestibulocochlear structure, this is where we hear the sound. The question probably come up, uh, why do we go through three different media? Why not just stay in the air all the way? Well, the cells that actually do the hearing that are in this little snail shell structure here, which is called the snail shell, basically, the Latin name is cochlea, it means a snail, uh, there are living cells in there called hair cells. And these hair cells cannot be dried out. If they are, they would die. So if they were exposed to air, such as in the outer ear, uh, they would simply perish. They have to be in this nice warm fluid with just the right pH, just the right osmolality, just the right uh, ion concentrations. And then they're happy and they work. The problem is when sound goes from air into water, basically, we have what's called an impedance mismatch. What this means is about 99.9% .9 of the sound energy is lost going into water. You've probably noticed this if you've been at the swimming pool or the lake and you're underwater. When you're underwater, you can't hear anyone talking or even yelling that's above the water. And that's because most of the sound reflects right off the water. It doesn't go into the water. A tenth of 1% actually enters the water. So these little bones in the middle air solve that problem for us. We'll get to that. Well, let's start with the outer ear. Uh, the outer ear would include uh, this flap that we oftentimes just call the ear, but as you see, the whole thing, outer, middle, and inner, is all really considered ear. A name for this might be oracle. Uh, it's a funnel. It, it helps to gather sound, so we're more sensitive to it. It helps us know whether sound is coming from the front of us or back of us, even when our eyes are closed. Then when we get past this oracle, we get to a hole on the side of our head called the external auditory canal, uh, the ear canal, filled with air. And uh, then we reach uh, the eardrum itself uh, that has the tympanic membrane. And finally, inside the ear canal, we have a substance that's my second favorite thing to talk about, and that's earwax. Kind of makes you wonder what my uh, favorite subject to talk about is. That would be mucus. Okay, I won't go there. We'll stick with the ear and the eye. Well, here we are in the outer ear, and the outer ear is lined with glands called ceruminous glands. They produce earwax, as they say, favorite subject. And uh, earwax is important. It kills bacteria. They find their way into the ear. It keeps the eardrum flexible and soft so they can respond to sound. It traps spores and dust. And another thing about that ear canal, I know there's a god as soon as I see it, and that is, you can't get your finger in the ear canal. Did you notice that? Your finger's a little bigger in diameter in the ear canal. If that weren't the case, you'd tell your little son, Elginon, Elginon, whatever you do, don't go putting your finger in your ear. You'll punch out an eardrum. Well, the next thing, there goes another eardrum. So uh, we have a problem here. We have dead cells that are being produced, just as they are in skin all over. This is lined with skin. Even the eardrum is a sheet of skin. And the dead cells are falling off the surface, plus we have all this earwax being produced. So dead cells and earwax and dead cells and earwax, and pretty soon we're going to have a clogged external auditory canal, and we can't get our finger in there to clean it out. Well, the Lord's aware of the problem. And so we have a really interesting conveyor system. Let's take a look at it. By the way, this ear canal is tuned like an organ pipe. It's length versus its width, so it's optimized to the frequencies of human speech. And how does the skin grow inside that ear canal? Instead of growing from the bottom to the top and falling off, it grows sideways, like a people mover in an airport. Uh, scientists have put little carbon particles on the eardrum and on the ear canal. They stick because it's waxy in there. 
Then they look in with an otoscope and see what happens to these particles, and they find that the skin lining that whole air canal, outer uh, air canal there, is growing sideways. It starts from the middle of the eardrum right here, grows peripherally to get to the edge, and then the cells spiral as they grow out, bringing the wax and dead cells out to where you can get at it with your finger. How's dumb luck working for you so far? <laughs> We're just getting started. Let's look at the middle ear. The other side of the middle ear is also tympanic membrane. There's some little bones in there called little bones. <laughs> Latin would be ossicles, this means little bones. They're the littlest bones in the body. And then there are little muscles attached to these little bones. And finally, there's a very special nerve that supplies this structure we're looking at in the inner ear, the vestibulocochlear nerve, or the eighth cranial nerve, it's called. Uh, let's look at the middle ear. Uh, here it is. It shows the three little bones there in the middle. And let's magnify them so we can see them a little better. And uh, there they are, the hammer, anvil, and stirrup, we call it. And uh, they fit in that middle ear space. Uh, the handle of the hammer is attached to the eardrum. Here it is here. And then this bone is called the anvil. It doesn't look like an anvil to me, but I guess they needed something for their hammer. And that anvil is attached to this stirrup-shaped bone called a stirrup. And its foot plate is an oval. And it fits into a little window that's oval, and it's called the oval window. That's not too hard to remember. And when the eardrum wiggles, what happens is because the eardrum is so big compared to this oval window and the foot plate of the stirrup, the forces here are magnified like a lever uh, to this structure down here. So we recapture some of that energy loss we had going from air into water. Uh, let's uh, magnify a little bit more. There you can see the stapes or the stirrup uh, in green. The Latin names are given for the other bones. The incus is the uh, anvil. And the malleus is the hammer, uh, and they're in the appropriate colors that you can see there. So uh, when the eardrum wiggles, it will push in and out of the uh, foot plate. When the eardrum wiggles over here, it will cause this foot plate of the stirrup to go in and out. And this chamber in here is filled with liquid. Well, how big are these little bones? The littlest bone in your body is the one shown in green here, the stapes or stirrup. It's three-tenths of an inch long and weighs one ten thousandth of an ounce. You think of the largest bone in our body as our femur and the thigh of our leg. Now, there's no other bone in the body that comes quite close to as tiny as this little stirrup does. And all three of the bones have some interesting characteristics. All three of these little bones are the only bones in the body that do not grow after we're born. So they're full size at birth. They're also the only bones in the body that don't have a marrow space uh, they're solid all the way through, presumably for acoustic purposes. But one of the most amazing facts uh, that I can share with you, I assume this is true, I haven't confirmed it independently, I've read it in the literature. In the range of human speech, which is 4 kilohertz, 4,000 cycles per second, our eardrum is said to respond to movements from the air in the range of one-tenth the diameter of a hydrogen atom. Think of that. Uh, it's absolutely amazing because the eardrum has red blood cells going through it. It's a piece of skin. And a red blood cell is almost infinitely bigger than a hydrogen atom. <laughs> It'd be like comparing Mount Everest to a BB from a BB gun. And so we have blood going through our eardrums, shaking the living daylights out of it by comparison, while we're hearing subatomic movements in the range of hydrogen atoms. <laughs> Well, there must be some noise suppression going on here. I would think the sound of the blood going through our eardrum would be the loudest thing we'd probably ever hear. It'd drive us insane. But it's all filtered out. It's all filtered out. Give you an idea how tiny these little bones are. Here they are compared to a U.S. dime. Nowadays, we work with credit cards so much, a lot of you maybe haven't even seen a dime. Uh, but it's a small coin, smaller than a penny. And uh, here are the three bones. Uh, in scale size to the dime. This little stirrup would be the smallest bone in the body. Well, let's put them in place in the uh, skull again. And what are the muscles that attach to these little bones? You wouldn't think little bones like this would need skeletal muscles, but they have two of them. 
One's called a tensor tympani. You see it up here. And uh, it attaches to the handle uh, of the uh, hammer. And uh, the other uh, muscles called a stapedius, this little muscle here, uh, there the both of them are, attaches to the, uh, oops, to the stirrup, or the, uh, yeah, the stapes, the stirrup. And what are these little muscles doing attached to these small bones uh, in the middle ear? Oh, this is so wonderful, I should charge you $5 a piece extra just to explain this. You'll understand what they do when you understand this. Ever been at a ball game, typically a basketball game, where they're going to make 100 points, just a question of who gets there first, and you have a fan sitting behind you with one of these air horns like they use in small watercraft, compressed air with a horn, and every time their team makes a basket, this fan behind you goes, mark, on the air horn. Now, the Lord knew there would be idiots like that. And so what these little muscles are doing is when a loud sound occurs, before you're really even aware of the sound, a reflex contracts those muscles, dampens these little bones so they don't overload. Can I get a question? How's dumb luck working for you on that one? Oh, it gets worse, wait, or better, I should say. Well, there are those two wonderful little muscles, a tensor tympani and a stapedius. Let's go to the inner ear, and that's where things start to get really complicated. Uh, here we are at the inner ear. It's a curious-shaped piece of bone. Uh, you can actually carve it out. Uh, it's a different density of bone than the bone that it's encased in. If you're wondering where this structure is located, behind your ear you can feel a bump called a mastoid process. Right straight in from there is where all of this is going on that we're talking about. And look at the curious shape. Uh, this whole structure is uh, much less than an inch in diameter, and you're seeing it here uh, magnified greatly. And it has uh, uh, about three main parts. It has this part that looks exactly like a snail shell. It's called the cochlea, which is Latin for snail shell. And then there's a middle part called the vestibule. And then we have these hollow canals called semicircular canals because they form half a circle. And uh, the cochlea is to hear things with. Uh, it has these special hair cells in it. Uh, the vestibule uh, is, aids in our ability to sense whether we're right side up or upside down, our sense of balance. And these little semicircular canals are oriented in the three planes about which we can move. There's a canal that goes this way, there's a canal that goes this way, and one goes this way. And the fluid inside of there can move and there's inertia. If I take a glass of water, and I do this very quickly, water will go over the top of the glass. There's an inertia. The water doesn't go quite as fast as the glass does at first. So uh, when we move in this axis, liquid in this vertical loop senses that we're moving from the inertia of the, inertia of the liquid. Uh, how does it know that? Well, at the end of each semicircular canal, there's a bulge called the ampulla, which basically means a bulge. And there's a valve in there that can move like this. So the inertia of the liquid, when we move like this, causes that valve uh, to move, and our brain knows we're moving in this axis. Uh, when we move like this, our brain senses that because we have a canal oriented like this. And when we move like this, <laughs> those are the three possibilities, uh, the one that's parallel to the floor is being activated. And so this little bony structure with its contents is giving us all the information of hearing, our sense of balance, and our sense of movement in space. Wow, that's quite a piece of equipment, isn't it? Well, let's get back to those two. There's two little windows into the center part, the vestibule. And the oval one is the oval window we've been talking about. Show blue arrow there. And the foot plate of the stirrup fits there. When the eardrum moves, the foot plate of the stirrup pushes in and out of the oval window. It's sealed at the edge like a surround on a speaker cone. And uh, inside of the system is a liquid, uh, mostly water, but uh, more complicated than that. And have you ever tried pouring, pushing a cork into a bottle that's full of water? The cork won't go in because uh, the water uh, is not compressible. So the only way the piston of the foot plate of the stirrup could go in and out along with the eardrum 
would be if the pressure could be relieved somehow inside of here. So there is a round window called, you guessed it, the round window, that's covered with a flexible or elastic membrane. So when the foot plate goes in on the oval window, uh, that round window then pouches out. So that allows liquid to kind of go back and forth inside of here, like they say, the music goes round and round. And that's going to create sound. We're going to take the mechanical energy of the eardrum moving, we're going to convert it to electricity, because our brain only understands electrical code. It doesn't understand mechanics. If we cut through this cochlea to see what's inside, it does indeed look like a snail shell. It's hollow in there, but all filled with liquid. And it's divided up into three channels, an upper channel, middle channel, and a lower channel, all full of liquid. In the middle channel is an organ called the organ of corti, and oh my, that's high on my list of some of the most amazing things God has created. Suffice it to say, when the eardrum moves and it pushes the foot plate of the stirrup in, the pressure of the liquid goes up the upper window to the top and comes back down the lower window, the two channel or the lower channel. The two channels are in communication uh, here at the top. So you can imagine, as the foot plate of the stirrup is going back and forth thousands of times a second, uh, one millisecond, the pressure will be higher at the top, the other at the bottom. Let's magnify one turn here and take a look at it at a little higher power. There we go. Bring it up where we can see it. So in the middle is this structure called the organ of Corti. And we have to remember, this is not just one little piece. The artist rendering here kind of shows it as one little piece. It's a strip. Organ of Corti is a strip like a belt running inside the spiral of the snail shell. And it's the pressure of the liquid alternating between the top and bottom that causes this middle chamber to bounce up and down. Think of it like a boat riding the waves in water. And the movement of the organ of Corti up and down generates electricity. How does it do that? Oh my goodness. This is going to get a little complicated, but stick with me. I think we can get this out. Here is the area of the organ of Corti, and now we magnify it and actually show a real one under the microscope, not a drawing. And again, this is a strip. We're just looking at one cut across the strip that spirals to the organ of Corti. And we can understand it this way. It's like our fist. There are cells in here called hair cells, and the hairs stick out of the top of the fist. Uh, the fist can go up and down, that's our organ of Corti, can ride the waves up and down. And there's a membrane over the top. It's called the tectorial membrane. The hairs stick into that. And when it goes up and down, it wiggles, the hairs. Uh, there's three rows of hair cells out here called the outer hair cells, and one row here, and this is that tectorial membrane. The hairs are too tiny to see. They're in the middle here. Let's uh, illustrate this with a drawing to make it a little bit more obvious. So again, this is a strip. We're just looking at one cross-section of it. Here are the three rows of outer hair cells, and these are the hairs at the top here. And oh, they're much smaller than human hair. These hairs are so tiny, you couldn't see one of them in a light microscope. You'd need an electron microscope. Now, you can see them collectively the way you can see hair in somebody's head a block away, but if they held up one hair, you couldn't see that one. So those hairs are sticking into this gelatinous tectorial membrane. Here's the inner hair cells, three rows of outer hair cells. And that's like my hand here, the tectorial membrane. The hairs are sticking up from what's shown in green there. Hairs stick in the tectorial membrane. When it goes up and down, you see, because of the mechanics, it's going to be bending, those hairs. Let's uh, magnify in the scanning electron microscope uh, just the hairs. And here they are, magnified thousands of times. Uh, these are the hairs on the outer hair cells. Here's the three rows out here. The cells themselves are below this level. We're just looking at where we pull the tectorial membrane off to look down on the hairs coming up. So here's a higher power yet. Uh, a red blood cell would never even begin to fit within this box here. It'd be much bigger, one red blood cell. I'll give you an idea of size. And notice we have three different lengths of hairs here. They're ranked like pipes in an organ. This is true of the outer hair cells. And it's these hairs that take mechanical energy from being wiggled and convert them into electricity. How do they do that? Well, look at this illustration here. We're showing one hair cell with different length hairs on it. Then we magnify from these 
two hairs, a shorter one and a taller one. And then we point out that the end of each hair has a hole in it. It's actually an ion channel. And this ion channel is gated with like a, a, a valve that can open and close. And the valve, let's magnify that. That would be over here. That's looking at just the tip of a hair. Oops, back it up. This is our ion channel here. Here's our trap door, a gate as it were. There's a molecular spring that attaches to this door and then attaches to the next highest hair. So imagine this now. If my fingers were the hairs, there would be an ion channel in each hair that allows electrically charged ions to go in, but there are little doors covering them. Then there would be taller hairs next to it. And there would be a spring-like attachment from the taller hair to the little trap door on the shorter hair. Now when we bend it, you see what would happen? That would pull the trap door open and closed up to 20,000 times a second for the highest notes, highest frequency notes we can hear. Well, I don't know about you, but I think the air is getting way too complicated. I want to talk about something simple that we can all understand. The human eye. Oh, you know you're in trouble already, don't you? Well, there it is. Boy, that's a wonderful piece of equipment you're looking at there, the human eye. It's kind of sobering to reflect on the fact that so far, our best effort at coming up with a total eyeball replacement is known as a glass eye. I'd stick to the original equipment if you can. And uh, there are different parts of this eye we're all familiar with. We have the eyelid, upper and lower. We have an iris right in here. We have the whites of the eyes. By the way, apes don't have a white sclera. They have a brown sclera and a brown iris. It's hard. The whole eye looks kind of brown. So whenever evolutionists show ape men uh, in an artist's illustration, they're always careful to put the whites in the eyes to make it look human. Of course, we don't have fossil evidence for that sort of thing. Right in the middle. We call that the pupil, huh? Uh, here's a question for you. What do the children of Israel call the pupil? Uh, this is going to be worth watching the whole <laughs> presentation just to get this little thing we're going to cover from Scripture here. The children of Israel call that pupil the apple of the eye. Is that ringing any bells? You are the apple of my eye. That is a term of the highest endearment, is it not? We reserve that for grandkids and uh, sons and daughters and what have you. They're, they're the apple of our eye. But what does that mean, that we love them as much as a Jonathan apple? No, it has a bigger meaning than that. And like a lot of our expressions, this meaning comes right out of the Bible. Sort of like the expression, the handwriting's on the wall, right out of the Bible. Well, so is apple of the eye. Let's dig into that. First time we encounter this is in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 10. It's God is dealing with the children of Israel as they're wandering 40 years in the desert, and he's guiding them. And in this verse from Deuteronomy, we read that. He, that is God, encircled him, that is the nation of Israel, as they wandered in the desert, he instructed him, here it comes, he kept him as the apple of his eye. Now the word keep here would be better translated protect rather than keep. We use that expression when we say, may the good Lord guard and keep you. That doesn't mean guard you and put you in his pocket. It means guard you and protect you. So I'm going to use the word protect instead of the word keep. I think it's a better choice. It makes it more understandable. God protected him as the apple of his eye. And what does that mean? Well, obviously the children of Israel knew anything that poked the eye hurt. They tended to blink before it even got there. They knew about the blink reflex. They probably didn't call it the blink reflex, but that's what it is. Anything gets close to your eye, your eye blinks. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to think, oh, that's getting close. I need to start closing. No, it's the fastest reflex in the body. How fast a reflex is, is how close are you uh, to the brain. And when you're on the eye, the eye is part of the brain. So you can't get any closer to the brain than the eye. It's, you're already there. And so that blank reflex was well understood and they knew it protected the eye. I walked into a crab apple tree in our front yard while working in the yard here a month ago or so. And before I knew it, those sticks were in my eyes and my eyelid closed fast enough to get a scratch on the lid and not on my cornea. And I, it was over before I knew what happened. 
So what a wonderful protective reflex. And the Lord wants you to think of that reflex that is absolutely instantaneous as the way he protects us. Wow, that's a whole new meaning for protecting the apple of the eye or for being the apple of somebody's eye, that we would be the apple of God's eye, but to know that that means he protects us as we protect the pupil of our eye. I'm told that this is the last reflex to be lost when people die. Different parts of the body become dysfunctional at different rates. But uh, this reflex is the last to be lost. Emergency medical technicians coming upon somebody who's comatose might gently touch the cornea over the pupil. If there's no blank, they're probably gone. Well, that's the way the Lord protects us. Instantaneously. To the death, even the death of his son, Jesus. That'd be worth praying for, wouldn't it? That we would uh, be, in fact, the apple of God's eye, that he would protect us as the apple of the eye. The Lord's written the prayer out for you. In the second place in the Bible, apple of the eye appears. In Psalm chapter 17, verse 8. Oh, this is beautiful. Instead of keep, I'm going to use the word protect. Lord, protect me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. Is that the kind of prayer the Lord answers in the affirmative? Absolutely. In fact, he's given us the answer to that prayer too in Scripture. In the third place, the apple of the eye expression is used. That's in Zechariah. It's been hiding there. I'll bet you haven't seen it before. Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8. And there it reads. Right here. For thus says the Lord of hosts, for he who touches you touches the apple of my eye. Wow. Anyone who would harm you is poking God in the eye, basically here. What a wonderful gospel message from the eye of all places. But you know, it's not from the eye. The gospel is not to be found in the body. We can see evidence of God's handiwork in our body, but we don't get the gospel there. The gospel is God's word, pure and simple. It always involves his word and the Holy Spirit. Those two together. God created the heavens, the earth with the word and the spirit. It changes our steely hearts to become believers through the Word and the Spirit. Wow. I could go on that one all day. Well, as they say, the eye is part of the brain. When you look at the eye, there's a little window right here. Uh, right here, there's a little window. We call it the cornea. The cornea is really a lens. In fact, it's four times more powerful than that part of the eye we call the lens. We have two lenses. It's just this part can't change focus. And this clear piece of like glass-like material here called the cornea is really derived from embryonic skin. Our eye has two embryological origins. Most of it is from neuroectoderm that's part of the brain. The rest of it is from the skin. So the skin actually goes down our eyelid, up inside, across the eye, up over the lower eyelid. It's just one piece of skin. It just happens this skin right in this area here is beautifully transparent like the finest crystal. As soon as you get to the edge of the cornea, all of a sudden you can't see through it anymore. All of a sudden we have blood vessels in here and all sorts of things. But right here we have a window. Think of it. We had a window develop in our skin. And a bud come off our brain, and it came right out where that window was and looked through it. If you left this all up to evolution, the brain could have been up here. That window could have been down here someplace. Anywhere, it could be in your arm, chance. I know the window is right where the bud comes off the eye and the brain looks through the window. Well, this is the way the eye looks as it develops. Over to the right here, if you're an embryologist, this is the diencephalon, part of the embryonic brain. And a hollow bud comes off. Initially, this was a ball. The ball gets pushed in, sort of like a basketball without air. And uh, this is the eyeball itself. Uh, out here is embryonic skin. This will form the cornea. In fact, let's look at all the things formed here. That inner layer of the ball, pushed in ball, is the retina, part of the brain. This outer surface is the cornea, developed from embryonic skin. And a little bud comes off the cornea, to form a hollow ball that will be our lens. 
You're probably wondering, how do we end up getting a solid lens from a hollow ball? What happens are the cells in the back part of the ball here elongate and they fill in this whole empty space. We call them lens fibers or lens prisms. So it goes from looking like that to looking like that. You'll see little dots in here. These are the nuclei. These are living cells in our lens at the edge, but as we approach the center of the lens, the cells are all dead. There are no nuclei, no mitochondria, no cell organelles. All of those are gotten rid of. The cell fills up with a special protein called crystalline. You know why they call that protein crystalline. It's as clear as crystal, but it's flexible like rubber. So that this lens can focus in a way that no lens on a camera made by humans works. Let's take a look at it. Here's the lens, a kind of a quarter view of it, suspended by little strings called zonule fibers. They're actually tubes. And this lens is rubbery. And if it weren't under tension, it would be round. But under tension from those fibers, it's flattened. And that's focused at a distance. To focus up close, the tension on these fibers is relaxed, and the lens just naturally rounds up, and then it's focused close. The cornea also is consisting of a structure that has no blood vessels in it. And so this is as clear as glass, as is the lens. Now imagine, how are we changing focus? We're changing the shape of the lens. How do we focus most instruments we work with? Microscopes, binoculars, telescopes, cameras, we move the lens front and back like this. Every time I focus a lens, I can just hear the Lord say, have some class. Recompute the whole lens, regrind it on the fly, change its whole refraction. You can do that. If you have a clear glass lens that's rubbery and you can change its shape, my goodness, you're using essentially a different lens for every distance you're looking at. But no, we move the lens back and forth, much more clumsy. But who can design a lens like this? Well, there's that iris we're talking about. There are muscles there to open and close it. Fluid is continuously produced by these little processes, and that fluid pumps up our eye like a tire. You see, the eye is flexible. It's basically made out of leather, most of the wall of the eye. And uh, it needs to be pumped up like a tire so that it's got a nice spherical shape. You don't want it to just collapse on itself. It wouldn't be able to focus. So that is accomplished by aqueous humor, a watery material that's produced. The back part of the eye is full of a gel, but the front part, the aqueous humor comes out into the anterior chamber here. And how do we keep the pressure at just the right level? We have a relief valve all along the edge here. These are called the canals of Schlem. I hope nobody got sprayed on that one. And uh, they go into a set of unusual vessels here uh, called the aqueous vessels. They're the only blood vessels in the body that carry water. And so water is drained off from the anterior chamber, goes out through the aqueous vessels and into vessels that take it away from the eye. If the pressure was too low in the eye, presumably uh, blood and fluids could flow back into that anterior chamber. Well, I'm glad it's all automatic. And then look at the edge of the lens where these little zonule fibers attach. This is a picture I took, I think a million years ago now that I think of it. This is at the very edge of the lens. These are the cells that were originally the round ball uh, the cells back here are the, uh, uh, the long fibers that make up the uh, lens of the eye. These little cells become elongated. So we call these lens prisms. And these are the, lens, uh, the cells of the uh, lens. Here are one of the fibers that hold the lens in position. There's a capsule around the lens. When you have cataract surgery, they try to preserve the capsule and then replace the lens itself with plastic. Well... If you uh, take a lens from somebody who is deceased, the lens dries out and it becomes quite hard. It's no longer rubbery. In fact, as we get old, our lens gets hard. We can't focus it anymore. That's why we can't see the way we did when we were younger. And if you whack the lens with a hammer, you can get a fracture plane to go right across the fibers. Uh, either that or it'll go between them. And when you do, you get this view over here. Looks like boards in a lumber yard. Those are the individual cells, each of these flat boards is a cell, of these lens fibers, each filled with the protein crystal and that makes them as clear as crystal. And the whole thing can change in shape to focus. You may be wondering, what holds these cells in such precise, almost lumberyard stacking pattern? Well, that's accomplished by thousands 
of peg and socket interlocks that lock one cell into its neighbor. Hey, I got a question for you. How's dumb luck working for you on this one? Well, this is the left eyeball as viewed from above. And uh, uh, you can see in the back here we have the retina. And if we magnify that, uh, here's the whole thickness of the retina. This is about the thickness of refrigerator shrink wrap, although it looks quite thick here. And uh, the light will come down from the top and will pass through all of these uh, uh, different cells that are in here. They're uh, neuronal cells, they're amacrine cells, there are a lot of different cells, and it's like a layer cake. There are layers of cells. The photoreceptors are way at the back here, and light has to go from the top through all those layers to get down to the bottom, and only down there do we run into those rods and cones that I've shown as little yellow dots there uh, that are uh, sensitive to light. Evolutionists look at this and they say, where is your God? He got the film and the camera upside down. He should have the light-sensitive cells facing the top rather than the base. This is uh, Richard Dawkins, a uh, retired uh, biologist from Oxford. Uh, and uh, he said that uh, any engineer would naturally assume that the photocells would point towards the light with their wires leading backwards towards the brain. He would laugh at any suggestion the photocells might point away from the light. Well, Richard should have uh, waited a little bit till they learned more about it because you see the retina is indeed a layer cake. You see all these layers. And the light does have to go through all these layers, which you might think would... Uh, cut down our light sensitivity and interfere with the resolution. Uh, but it turns out that there's one type of cell that uh, goes through the whole thickness of the eye. It's right there. It's called a Mueller cell. And I remember when I was teaching in the medical school, we had no idea what the Mueller cells did. We have lots of ideas today. Uh, this cell does a number of different things, but it turns out it's a living fiber optic. So light can enter one end of the Mueller cell. This is what they look at like in 3D. Light can enter one end, go at about 186,000 miles a second down through this tubular uh, light tube and be sensed down here. And it doesn't make any difference how much this wiggles around on the way down as long as the input and output are in register. We have fiber optics. And it turns out it's optimum to put these photoreceptor cells towards the back of the retina rather than towards the front because they have high nutritional requirements and that's where the blood supply is for the most part. There are some blood vessels on top of the retina too, so the retina is really a sandwich of blood vessels. Here we see them. This is what the ophthalmologist sees when they look into your eye with the uh, ophthalmoscope. Uh, there's one little spot here where we see everything most clearly called the fovea. You ever notice that? When you look at something, you know, I look at an audience, I can see one person sharp, everybody else is blurry. If I try to look at the whole crowd, then you're all blurry. <laughs> but if I focus on one individual, that I can see. People say, why didn't God make us so that the whole eye was like the fovea? Everything's sharp. Can you imagine reading the stock market report, eight columns of figures, each figure saying, pick me, pick me? The Lord knows we can't concentrate on that many things. We can't concentrate on 500 people individually at once. We can deal with one. Lord doesn't have a phobia. He can look at us all, see us all clearly at once. We're limited because we can't handle any more than one area of sharp vision. And by the way, all these little vessels on top, our brain filters those out so we don't see them when we look. Well, we have muscles that move our eye up and down. Uh, here's the eyeball and we have a muscle on top called the superior rectus. That lets, lets the eyeball look up. We have a muscle in the bottom called the inferior rectus, which simply means straight muscle. That allows us to look down. Uh, we have a muscle over towards the nose called the medial rectus, allows our eye to look towards the nose. And then we have a muscle on the lateral side called the lateral rectus, allows us to look away. So you got the picture up, down, left, and right probably wondering what this thing was doing staring at you through the whole talk. Uh, this ball represents the eyeball. Got a red mark here for reference. And uh, so we have a muscle that can look up. We have a muscle that allows us to look down. If the nose is over here, we have a muscle medial rectus to look towards the nose. And we have a lateral rectus to look away from the nose. 
So four different axes. Oh, we could use our head to do this, but isn't it great? We can do a certain amount of it with our eyes. But we don't just have four muscles, we have six. What are the other two doing? Oh my goodness, you'll lose sleep over this one. We have a muscle at the bottom called the inferior rectus that rotates our eyeball uh, so that uh, uh, it rotates out. And we have an in a superior rectus on the top that rotates the eyeball in. Now, why on earth do we want to rotate our eyeball this way? Well, it turns out that as we walk, our body is shifting from side to side a little bit, and the horizon is not staying perfectly level. So when our body goes this way, our eyeball rotates to stay right side up. And when our body goes this way, the eyeball rotates to stay right side up. Uh, now, it only works from shoulder to shoulder. And you can see it. Look at somebody's eyes, have them tilt their head shoulder to shoulder. Look at a little mark in the eye. You'll see the eyeball staying right side up. You don't have any control over that one. The Lord takes care of that. You do have some control over looking up, down, left, and right. Here's the thing that's interesting. The two eyes have to see exactly the same thing. You can't have one eye looking over here, another one looking over here. How far can they be off? One degree. If the up and down is off by more than one degree, or the left and right, you will see double. But even the rotation has to be the same in the two eyes, or you'll see double. We call it diplopia. Wow. That's, imagine if somebody had a pair of six guns and could shoot with that kind of accuracy. They would have a target maybe 50 yards away, and they'd pull out the two pistols and fire instantly, and they not only would hit the bullseye, but they would make one hole. That would be real shooting. That's what your eyes are doing. Everywhere you look, the two eyes are within a degree of up, down, left, right, and rotation. What do you figure, dumb luck? I don't think so. Yeah. Look at this superior oblique that rotates the eyeball in. There's no room for it in there. There's no room to run uh, the way this one does, crossways. So this muscle runs longitudinally, but in order to roll the eyeball in in this direction, it has a little tendon, a little thicker than a hair, that goes through something like a pulley. It's actually called a trochlea and comes out in the eyes. So when the force is directed uh, from front to back, it rotates the eyeball in. So uh, wonderful muscles of the eye. And we have muscles in our eyelids that allow them to open and close. Uh, we produce uh, uh, tear fluid that is here at the edge of the eye, in the, under the upper lid, and the tear fluid comes across our eye to our nose. And when it gets to the nose, the tear fluid is pumped off into our nose. That's why you get the sniffles when you cry. Uh, how do we pump the fluid off? Look in the mirror very carefully, right near your nose here. Each eyelid has a tiny little hole called the puncta, and there's a little muscular pump in there that pulls the fluid off the cornea of the eye. Now you're probably thinking, I know why we make this tear fluid. It gets dust and dirt off our eyes and keeps our eye moist. Well, that's all true. But the main function for the tear fluid is so we get good, sharp resolution. You see, the surface of our cornea is rough. It's like taking a pair of glasses and taking sandpaper. You ever do that to a pair of glasses? Boy, you can ruin a pair of glasses in a hurry. It looks all milky with those scratches. That's the way your cornea is. But... God has designed glands that make a layer of fluid with just the right refractive index. It covers just to the right depth. If it's too thick or too thin, it'll be blurry. And so we're seeing through an air-water interface. You can't get any smoother than that. You ever notice you start tearing up, you get blurry-eyed? That's because the tear fluid layer is too thick. You bat your eyes a few times, the drops fly, and it makes things clear up. So... Uh, this constant washing of fluid has to be just the right thickness for us to see uh, clearly, and it's pumped off into those little puncta. You may want to take a peek in a mirror at that. And then we have muscles that go to our upper eyelid, and it's mostly the upper eyelid that moves. If you check, the lower eyelid doesn't move much when you blink. It's the upper one that's doing most of the movement. And there's a muscle in there, and uh, it's called the levator palpebri superioris. How about that? It <laughs> simply means the lifting muscle for the upper eyelid, uh, levator palpebri superioris. And that muscle's like the muscle in your arm, okay? 
Uh, but if I were to use a muscle in my arm, which is called skeletal muscle, just to hold up this little pointer, in a half hour, my arm would be going down. I couldn't hold it up anymore. That's because skeletal muscle fatigues. It's great for voluntary motions to do this kind of thing, but to sit and hold this out all day, it's not designed for that. The muscle fatigues. The Lord's aware of the problem. So the levator muscle is used to open and close our eyes to blink at folks and what have you, and we have voluntary control over that if we want. But, oh, here it is, a second muscle. And our friend uh, Mueller comes in again. <laughs> In addition to the Mueller cell and the retina, we have Mueller's muscle here in the eye. And this is a little piece of smooth muscle that's attached along with the skeletal muscle. So you get the picture? We have a skeletal muscle to voluntarily move our lids up and down when we want. But we have a smooth muscle that doesn't fatigue. That's a characteristic of smooth muscle. They can hold the lid open all day long. So we have a non-fatiguing smooth muscle to hold the lid up in the long haul and a skeletal muscle to go around winking at folks. Well, how about dumb luck for this one? Well, the tear fluid is produced by the tear glands that you see up here. These are well under the eyelid. You normally can't feel these. And the tear fluid comes across the eye to here, goes to the little puncta and into a lacrimal duct that goes down into the nose. And so the fluid enters into our nasal cavity, producing the sniffles that we associate with uh, crying. Speaking of crying, that's a good way to end the uh, presentation here. Uh, pull us all together for you with scripture. Human beings are the only creatures that can cry emotional tears. There are other animals that, that can uh, produce tear fluid, but not emotional tear fluid. And what does the Lord have to say about this in Revelations 21, verse 4? And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. That's what I wanted to share with you today. Uh, before I leave, I just kind of wanted to remind you of some things that we'd like to have you consider. One is to go on your internet and go to AnswersInsider.com if you haven't already done that. There you can sign up online to get our Answers Insider, which is a newsletter, very newsy. The ads that are in it are ads of interest to you from products that we uh, sell, and uh, you maybe would want to purchase some of those, but the newsletter's free. And uh, if you'd like, in addition to signing up and getting the newsletter, you can ask to receive Ken Ham's book, Fire in My Bones. This is Ken's testimonial. Ken Ham, as you may know, is the fellow that uh, really founded the whole Answers in Genesis organization, uh, uh, had the Creation Museum built, and now has built the Ark. You might want to wonder, wow, what kind of... What kind of childhood and fetching up and stimulation did this man have in his life to let him do all of this? Well, you can get that in Fire in My Bones. Free. And then uh, Ken Ham has written a book which most of us here at the Creation Museum sort of look at as the, the Bible of creation <laughs> in addition to the Bible itself. This little book has been out for about 20, 25 years now. It's gone through several editions, improved with each one, and it just really deals with the heart of our ministry, which is how, how does creation fit in with the gospel of Jesus Christ? What's the relevance? Why is it important? Why is creation important? It covers that as long as, as well as evidence for and against creation and evolution. He's expanded on this in a bit uh, in a book called The Gospel Reset. Uh, in this book, he looks at how Genesis is essential to our understanding of the gospel and the salvation through uh, Jesus Christ. So a new book, Gospel Reset, the relevance of the whole book of Genesis. This is a book I had a hand in, several of us at the museum did. Uh, it's called Glass House, just came out this past year. And uh, as the subtitle says, Shattering the Myth of Evolution, we've just taken a lot of the current thinking of the creation-evolution debate, brought things up to date. I have two chapters in this particular book. One deals with the evidence, such as it is, for human evolution and against it. 
I had the most fun writing a chapter on the question, are birds dinosaurs? Have you heard that birds are dinosaurs? The answer is no, not even close. And I cover it in considerable detail. You might be interested in it. Check it out. Glass House. If you just want the whole enchilada, like people say, uh, where do I start? I'm really interested in the creation evolution controversy. I have a thousand different questions. Where can I go to get them all answered? This four volume set of books answers over 100 of the most asked questions that we've gotten in traveling around speaking as well as here at the museum and the ark. I have chapters in each of the books, all of our speakers here do, and uh, they can be purchased individually uh, or they can be purchased as a box set, which I recommend if you don't have one or more of them. Then we produced an answers book for teens. We kind of took the answers books and brought them down to the issues that are the most important we find to teens. Uh, this was done by Bodie Hodge, uh, Tommy Mitchell, who's passed away just recently, great loss and uh, Ken Ham. There's really two volumes for the answers book for teens, uh, so you might want to pick up both if you have a teenager uh, you're, you want to share with. And then we have the answers book for kids. This is for the under teenage. These are little slender books like children uh, can get through in a while. It covers a lot of the spiritual dimension of the creation issue. And uh, you can get them as individual books, but I recommend, again, uh, getting the box set uh, uh, getting the whole set of books. Uh, another new book that was produced just recently by Ken Ham and Bodie Hodge is A Flood of Evidence. deals with the flood. Uh, it's sort of the answers book for the global flood. Uh, talks about uh, the evidence for the flood, uh, the importance of the flood again to us as Christians. And uh, I recommend it. Uh, this is a book for our time, if ever there was one and needed. Uh, it's uh, one race, one blood. It deals with this whole issue of how do we as Christians view our fellow human beings. And we know from Scripture we are to view them as one blood. We all ultimately share the same parents, Adam and Eve. Uh, Ken Ham got together with Dr. Charles Ware and uh, have produced, I think, a very influential book here. We have a version of that book for kids. brings it down to the level of kids, one blood. And then, oh, I have a number of different books out there, too. Form to Fly is on birds. Uh, one of my favorite creatures are birds. I have scanning electron micrographs that I've taken myself of feathers, and I think you get a kick out of it. Uh, maybe you want this lecture, Hearing Ear and the Seeing Eye. I mean, you get this lecture, you get all this, pretty much the same pictures. I use a little more updated version. But uh, even the jokes are the same. So, uh, and then uh, of all the resources I've made, this one has been the most popular. It's called Fearfully and Wonderfully Made, The Development of the Baby in the Womb, focusing particularly on that first week, fertilization, implanting, and the beginning of the placenta. But we do skip through to the end and talk about uh, the birth process itself. Then if you really can put up with me that much, I have a whole course called Body of Evidence. It covers most of the organs in the body, and uh, you may find this uh, to be uh, of use. There's eight DVDs. Each runs about an hour and a half. I sat down with a couple of homeschoolers that were in uh, high school age when I dealt with them. They, they've both gotten through college now, so we didn't give them too bad a steer. And uh, I use a lot of models and examples, and we talk about most of the organs of the human body. You can get them as individual issues or, or copies, too cells and tissues, one on the skin. This is an area in which I did a lot of research and have published papers on the whole skin, which is a fascinating organ. Uh, the skeletal system, cartilage and bone, the cardiovascular system, heart and blood vessels, the respiratory system, how do the lungs work, the digestive system, uh, all uh, 18, 20 feet of it from beginning to end. Uh, and then a Lecture similar to what you just heard called the hearing ear and the seeing eye. And one on the urinary system. So you can see we cover quite a bit of the body. Uh, suitable for, I would say, junior high, high school, particularly the homeschool crowd. And uh, I think you'd enjoy it. Couldn't get through this without ans uh, addressing Answers Magazine. This is a magazine we've had a lot of success with. Currently, it's a six-issue family magazine. Some people say it's really two magazines. There's an insert just for kids, things of interest to them. Buddy Davis plays a big role in that. And uh, 
deals with a lot of issues, not just creation and evolution, but uh, uh, other issues as well uh, to the Christian. While we're closed, we're giving a special deal. This will stop once we open up for outside people coming in again. But for now, uh, free shipping on orders of $50 or more. That'll be good until we open the doors to the public. Uh, you hear about sales sometimes where you can get something that regularly sells for $50. It's on sale for $49. This isn't like that. This is a real discount. <laughs> we have an apologetics online course. You stream it at your own pace. You can take up to two years to cover it. It's our master class. It's six sessions. Uh, it normally would sell for $294. What about this for a special $19? So if you've got some time now, this would be a good time to begin. This streaming apologetics class doesn't require any additional information other than your Bibles. Uh, and what can I say? Help? <laughs> like the rest of you out there, we've really been going through it with the shutdown due to the coronavirus. And uh, suffice to say, it's difficult. Uh, a lot of people doing without income right now, and I know it affects you too. But if you can't help us, if you're in a position to do that, boy, we'd really appreciate it now. Uh, either a one-time payment or a monthly gift. And uh, just go to answersingenesis.org on your computer and then slash donate, and you'll have an opportunity. Our live programming has changed as of last Wednesday, so keep this in mind. Uh, our online uh, Facebook and uh, internet streaming programs we will have 12 o'clock programs every weekday, Monday through Friday. We'll have two, two o'clock programs every weekday, Monday through Friday. This is an example of one of the one o'clock programs. And then on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we'll have presentations. And on Tuesday and Thursday, we'll have yet other presentations at seven o'clock in the evening, mostly tours of the museum and things like that. So, and then Saturday at 7 p.m. and Sunday at 7 p.m. So, check out all of our live streaming. We're doing a lot of it now. And speaking of live streaming, we've just started our own uh, streaming video, sort of like some of the other uh, things you can get. Uh, this is a Christian streaming video. Uh, it's all of Answers videos, basically all of our courses that we've produced, uh, all live streamed, all in one place. Uh, we've also partnered with other like-minded people, Ray Comfort, for example, and his videos. And uh, you can get these online. Go to answers.tv, and there you'll get a chance to get a free trial to try it out. The library is going to grow immensely over time, but $39.95 a year, uh, which is uh, pretty reasonable, I think, uh, for such a package as this. So check it out on the internet. It's Answers TV. Start your seven-day free trial. If you don't like it, quit. Otherwise, uh, $39.99, and it can be purchased on a monthly basis, too, I understand. By this summer, we're going to have a special app. You won't have to watch it on the internet or what have you. Uh, you'll be able to, uh, or at least in your computer, you'll be able to watch uh, our programming with an Apple iPhone, iPad, or Apple TV. We'll have an app just for those. We'll have an app for Android phones, tablets, and Android TV. We'll have an app for your Roku streaming device, if you have one on your TV. We will have an app for Microsoft Xbox, if you're working with that. And if you have a Samsung TV 19, or 2017 or later, uh, it will work directly on the TV. So that's coming up this summer. Otherwise, in the meantime, you can still get it on the internet. Well, that's what I had to share with you today. Thanks for spending the afternoon with me.